Dr. Paul Ziz was head of hypersonic research during his career at the McDonnell Douglas Aerospace Corporation. And these were the concepts we were looking at uh, 30 years ago. He has no doubt in the shockwave or air spike carves a path through the air by ripping electrons from molecules to form a plasma. This forms a cushion between the shockwave and the aircraft's skin. The Russians have induced a cold plasma by means of a plasma torch that introduces electrons. It makes the air electrically conductive, uh, very low energy in the front of this vehicle. And in doing so, in a mechanism that we do not yet understand or cannot calculate, the strength of the shock wave uh, reduces in half. So the entire vehicle now flies through the air at half the drag it would have with, if it did not have the plasma torch here. Half the drag. Half the drag with it, from having a plasma torch in front of your aircraft, creating a plasma bubble. That was the first clip that I watched that made me realize there was a connection between plasma and these plasma orbs and our hypersonic vehicles and our spycraft. Because clearly they figured out how to take this plasma sheath and turn it into a bubble, a drone around your craft. That's what they figured out. And it wasn't just random people they figured out. Literally the guy that was just speaking, Paul Sizz, was one of the people that figured it out, chat. He was one of the people that figured it out. So if you love this, here we go. We're not going to listen to all this, but there's actually an interview up here at the top. We're going to listen to a little bit of it. He talks about working on the Aurora, which is, I think, a secret spy plane. He says, there's no magic required for a Mach 6 aircraft. Teams like his had the know-how decades earlier. So they knew how to do it a long time ago. This implies that it wasn't new physics they understood. They didn't discover new physics. They've known about this, let's call it UFO physics, although it's not. It's really just... Tesla science resonance. They knew about this for decades. Hypersonics are all about response time. So they just wanted to make things go faster. The NASP team wrestled with the knot that sits at the heart of hypersonics. How to breathe air efficiently while the air itself tries to melt your vehicle. Dual mode ramjet scramjet combustors had to transition cleanly as inlet mock climbed. Just as challenging as physics was the problem that wrapped it. NASP became a big tent enough for NASA centers, Air Force labs, and multiple primes, each with its own design center of gravity. Work share agreements, multiplied test articles and review boards, requirements involved as stakeholders added just one more capability. So right here, this is huge. This is telling us how did this conglomeration, how did this actually happen? How did they develop this? You're seeing it right here. They developed a combination of NASA researchers, Air Force, and probably private contractors, people like Paul Sizz, who I think was working for Boeing at the time or the precursor to Boeing. And they figured out air breathing magnetohydrodynamics in their plasmas. There it is. This connects the Air Force right there. Scram jets to a neutronic fusion. Well, then, let me just get my gla reading glasses on right here for this part. Where NASP largely stopped at low Earth orbit, SIS's next act aimed past it. Working with David Fronin, his name sounds familiar because David Fronin is on the scientific paper about uh, future military craft that use plasma and uh plasma weapons and gravity devices he fleshed out a reusable single stage space plane concept that air breathes to a very high mach number then hands off to a compact a neutronic fusion rocket the favored cycle mhd aided air breathing to roughly mach 12 slash 14 then ignition of a dense plasma focused fusion stage for the push to orbit and beyond. Wow. Wow, chat. I'm trying to wrap my brain around this right now. Is that what the orbs are doing? Are, 
Is that what the orbs are doing? Are they using air breathing to engage the plane and then flipping over to dense plasma focus? Is that the reason why the dark lines appear in front of the orbs after they've engaged the plane? So you see the orbs. I'll go full screen here. The first orb, I mean, look how fast it comes in. This orb is going several, like Mach 3 or something like that. It's going really fast when it comes in. But then once it gets on the plane, I think it switches propulsion. Like you only see the lines appear in front of the orbs after they've engaged the plane. So if you missed it from that video, then let me show you this other one real quick. I don't want to sidetrack too much here, but so here's the other one. So watch when the orbs first approach the plane. There's no line in front of the orb. There's no black line in front of the orbs. It'll zoom in here and you'll see there's no black line in front of the orb right now you can kind of see the beginning of a black line in front of this first orb the orb on the top has no black line in front of it right and now all of a sudden it's like all three lines like get turned on now you can see the lines in front of all three of them pretty clearly really makes me wonder and those are x-rays almost certainly what you're seeing in those black lines are x-rays that are being developed from they're using a high-powered laser to cause this fusion to happen inside these plasma orbs um or they're producing a high-powered like x-ray free electron laser it's not quite like a conventional laser like we would think i mean you can definitely see the lines in front of them during this part right here i mean you can clearly see the lines you can see this straight line right here before the orb on all, all three orbs have a line in front of it Definitely makes me wonder. I mean, I'll, I might as well play it out for posterity. I'm about to see a plane get teleported out of the sky. Poof. It's just gone. It's just gone. It was there, and now it's not there. Frame doesn't even slow down. Just not there anymore. Guy zooms out. You can still see the drone. Those are the drone on the zoom out. And by the way, look at that. Using dense plasma focus, using proton 11 boron fusion. So this fuel source, boron-11, that's even beyond helium-3. The hierarchy goes helium, it goes like a, a hot fusion, deuterium, tritium. Then you've got uh, helium-3 uh, fusion. And then beyond that, you've got boron-11. Boron-11 is the dream. And here's Paul Sis talking about casually using boron-11 in a dense, dense plasma focus. So the military has known about boron-11 a-neutronic fusion, which, again, is only one of three a-neutronic fusion fuels. They've known about it for a really, really, really long time. The rationale is elegant. A hypersonic speed and thin air, MHD can extract hundreds of megawatts of electrical power from the ionized flow, more than enough to sustain ionization and charge the DPF ignition pulses at around Mach 12. With fusion lit, the system can even feed back power to augment the air breathing thrust until roughly Mach 14, smoothing the transition rocket. Okay, chat. I'm calling it. I'm calling it right now. Paul Sizz either helped build the MH370 orbs or his exact science was used in their development, one or the other. There is no way that this is a coincidence. Paul says, I mean, we're literally listening to somebody explain exactly how the orbs work in the MH370 videos. Not, not random other stuff. Literally how the orbs work in the MH370 videos, it's right there. Technically, the DPF stage operates as a pulsed coaxial Z-pinch. Wow. Capacitor banks discharge to form, accelerate, and focus a plasmoid to fusion conditions, then expand the exhaust through a magnetic nozzle. Post-combustion, the plasma jet couples magnetically to a stator pickup to generate electrical power. No turbines required. So they literally are able to produce, they basically turn the engine into a turbine without the turbine being required whatsoever. There's no jet. There's nothing spinning. You don't have a jet fan in there. It literally can produce electrical current just from ionizing the plasma and then 
focusing the plasma through this uh like magnetic pinch essentially yeah it's a little bit it's like a squirt gun that's a good analogy thank you it's like a squirt gun the design Fronin's team examined points to thrust levels in the 300 to 1,000 kilonewton class. So this is the part where people don't believe this stuff because they're like, wait, 15 to 20 ton packages could be moved by this? This is the stuff where Elon would never believe this until he saw it. And he says, SIS's operational logic reappears in the flight profile. Keep nuclear ignition out of dense air to sidestep safety controversies and use the fusion stage not merely to reach orbit, but to routinely go higher. This is the part where I wonder if Paul Sizz saw wormholes. Did he see that we were going to use this to make wormholes? Or was he just trying to make a better rocket engine and he just helped develop the orbs, the drones, so to speak? Because the other thing that's beneficial, like he said, we can make, we can pull all this energy. These things can make all this electricity. That electricity is being used as those non fission ignition. Those plasma orbs are now an electrical detonator of the lithium on board the plane. That's what they're doing. They're basically big bolts of lightning, but really, really big bolts of lightning. So they turn these plasma balls into an electrical generator that's that's basically building up as it flies through the sky, adding, adding, adding electricity. It's building up its charge. So its charge gets really high, and then they collapse them together onto their focal point, which is where you've got the lithium. Boom, fusion reaction. A 2050 vehicle pushes it further augmenting jet and fusion propulsion with field propulsion. Wait, what? That's this field propulsion right there. Uh, by the way, chat, field propulsion is gravitational manipulation. That's what UFOs are using. Field propulsion, by the way. 2050 pushes it further, augmenting jet and fusion propulsion with field propulsion. Concepts like conditioned electromagnetic fields to ease reaction to gravity and inertia a woodward style transient mass fluctuations and even quantum vacuum extraction as an electrical back end the aim is a two times increase in effective delta v without growing the airframe so they're trying to keep it small opening routine cis lunar and rapid earth moon Lar lagrange uh, logistics says never claimed these were solved they were bets placed on where high power electromagnetic systems and metamaterials might lead parallel parametric work from the air force research labs and university partners mapped the fusion box itself with reasonable gain and high nozzle efficiency the dense plasma focus system could yield hundreds of megawatts to multi-gigawatt excess electrical power beyond what is sent to the jet. A headroom for comms, sensors, pulsed plasmoid weapons, ultra-high powered lasers, and gravity-adjacent devices. Sis also argued that the fusion choice matters both politically and environmentally. The proton-boron-11 reactions clean exhaust is helium ions and soft x-rays. External radiation can be minimized again. Lit at altitude far from atmospheric pathways. Wow, dude. In the ORB videos, we are looking at this technology. We are looking at this dense plasma focused technology using field reverse configuration, combining these concepts of field reverse configuration and uh, aneutronic fusion using dense plasma focus. They turned it into a propulsion. Yes, the only the only outputs are soft x-rays, guys. That's why you're seeing the x-rays, the black lines in front of the orbs. It's all aneutronic. They're using aneutronic fusion reactions. The other part of it is the time frame. The time frame also perfectly matches the MH370 videos. Like they were talking about this in 2005, 2006. And then in 2014, we're seeing a plane getting zapped by this technology. 
That's plenty of time for the military to have developed it, even if they only were thinking about it in 2005. Breakthrough physics and technology for 2025 and 2050. They knew that that technology, even though the military already had it in the 2000s and the 2010s, they knew that the public wasn't going to know about it until 2050. Basically, they're hiding this technology for as long as possible. Probably people ask me all the time, like, when is this going to come out? Well, you're literally have you're listening to it come out right now. You're listening to the evidence yourself. But the other part of it is the U.S. military will only admit it when China figures it out. Then the United States will go, uh, yeah, don't worry. Those are China and we have them too. That's what they're going to say. They're going to say, yeah, we got the plasma drones too. We've had the plasma drones for 20 years. Paul Sids is out here saying, we understood this physics going back to like the 60s. We've had this physics figured out for a long time. It was a material science problem. So let's listen to a little Paul Sids in his own words. So I don't know when this interview happened, but shout out to Tim Ventura. He has really good interviews. Um, they're all audio. A lot of the older ones are audio, which are great. But once again, we're only going to get this technology. Like nobody's going to come save us. Aliens aren't coming to save us. Um, the government's not coming to save us. The government's not going to willfully tell us about their thermonuclear super weapons, right? They're never going to. Why would they do that? They probably have like laws that prevent them from ever saying anything about it. So the only time this will become public knowledge is when we get into World War III and we start shooting a neutronic super weapons at each other or when China figures out the plasma orbs and they start flying plasma orbs around, which maybe they were doing that during the, the New Jersey drone sightings. Paul Sizz was not some random guy. Like this guy, he was like being asked to lead. Like uh, I think it was Rocketdyne. I have to look at exactly which company. I think they folded into Boeing later on, or maybe it was L3 Harris. But Paul Sizz tells this story about how one of the high up people at the company takes him to this meeting and then he introduces Paul Sizz as like the new head of research and development or new head of engineering or whatever. Like Paul Sizz was a very humble guy that was extremely intelligent and all he cared about was aerospace engineering. One of the links in that clip that I was just showing or in the article I was just showing is a full textbook that Paul Sizz wrote with someone else. It's like 500 pages. Let's listen to the, air, the Aurora aircraft and the fusion reactor here. Budget line item for Aurora on a, on a funding uh, form, I guess. And I guess it was a very do high dollar value. And so his first assumption was, this is the Aurora aircraft, which is really what, what prompted me to, to kind of start trying to follow up on this and say to my, you know, I'm trying to ask the questions in terms of, well, is this thing out there? Is it more than a ghost aircraft or is there some reality to it? If, if there's no magic to build it. As I say, I was convinced the group I was with at the Tom Douglas in, in, the, in the mid 60s could build it. Uh, Mel Buck at Wright Patterson. We did. We had two models that we built for him that did uh, pressure measurements, force measurements, and thermal mapping to get the surface heat transfer rates. And those models went in every tunnel from our polysonic to uh, to a low speed tunnel to the tunnels on a Tullahoma, the 16 foot tunnels tunnel. I love this guy, uh, Chad. The Mach six tunnel, the Mach eight tunnel. We had flight. We had data on those things. I th I think they had over 1,300 hours of um wind tunnel test time on them and they were made out of uh, out of plastic yeah yeah so he's saying we built this stuff man this isn't he's saying this isn't me just messing around telling you stories about theoretical things he's like we're literally out here building these prototype aerospace craft for people that nobody's ever going to see in the public because it's under national security or it was under a private corporation